to this choir. May they accept the thanks of everyone in this audience and all who heard them sing this choral prayer, which is surely the ultimate sermon of this or any conference of this church, and the cry of every human heart. Thank you. Now, if I can speak, I'll try to do so. Prophecies regarding the last days often refer to large-scale calamities, such as earthquakes or famines or floods. These, in turn, may be linked to widespread economic or political upheavals of one kind or another. But there is one kind of latter-day destruction that has always sounded to me more personal than public, more individual than collective, a warning, perhaps, more applicable inside the church than outside it. The Savior warned in the last days, even those of the covenant, the very elect, could be deceived by the enemy of truth. If we think of this as a form of spiritual destruction, it may cast light on another latter-day prophecy. Think of the heart as the figurative center of our faith, the poetic location of our loyalties and our values. And then consider Jesus' declaration that in the last days men's hearts shall fail them. The encouraging thing, of course, is that our Father in Heaven knows all of these latter-day dangers, these troubles of the heart and the soul and has given counsel and protections regarding them. In light of that, it has always been significant to me that the Book of Mormon, one of the Lord's powerful keystones in this counteroffensive against latter-day ills, begins with a great parable of life, an extended allegory of hope versus fear, of light versus darkness, of salvation versus destruction, an allegory of which Sister Ann Dibb spoke so movingly this morning. In that dream, Lehi's dream, an already difficult journey gets more difficult when a mist of darkness arises obscuring any view of the safe but narrow path his family and others are to follow. It is imperative to note that this mist of darkness descends on all the travelers, the faithful and the determined ones, the elect, we might even say, as well as the weaker and ungrounded ones. The principal point of the story is that the successful travelers resist all distractions, including the lure of forbidden paths, and jeering taunts from the vain and proud who have taken them. The record says that the protected did press their way forward continually, and I might add tenaciously, holding fast to a rod of iron that runs unfailingly along the course of the true path. However dark the night or the day, the rod marks the way of that solitary redeeming trail. I beheld, Nephi says later, that the rod of iron was the word of God leading to the tree of life, a representation of the love of God. Viewing this manifestation of God's love, Nephi goes on to say, I looked and beheld the Redeemer of the world who went forth ministering unto the people. And I beheld multitudes of people who were sick and who were afflicted with all manner of diseases and with devils and unclean spirits, and they were healed by the power of the Lamb of God, and the devils and the unclean spirits were cast out. Love, healing, 
help, hope, the power of Christ to counter all troubles in all times, including the end of times. That is the safe harbor God wants for us in personal or public days of despair. That is the message with which the Book of Mormon begins, and that is the message with which it ends, calling all to come unto Christ and be perfected in Him. That phrase, taken from Moroni's final lines of testimony, written 1,000 years after Lehi's vision, is a dying man's testimony of the only true way. May I refer to a modern last day's testimony. When Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram started for Carthage to face what they knew would be an imminent martyrdom, Hiram read these words of comfort to the heart of his brother. Thou hast been faithful, wherefore thou shalt be made strong even unto the sitting down in the place with which I have prepared in the mansions of my father. And now I, Moroni, bid farewell until we shall meet before the judgment seat of Christ. A few short verses from the twelfth chapter of Ether in the Book of Mormon. Before closing the book, Hiram turned down the corner of the page from which he had read, marking it as part of the everlasting testimony for which these two brothers were about to die. I hold in my hand that book, the very copy from which Hiram read, the same corner of the page turned down, still visible. Later, when actually incarcerated in the jail, Joseph the prophet turned to the guards who held him captive and bore a powerful testimony of the divine authenticity of the Book of Mormon. Shortly thereafter, pistol and ball would take the lives of these two testators.